I'm fed up with the Church of St. Scenery. <laughs> with all them stamps, what is the plaques and cups and knives and forks? With this church or face on them. Peter Sellers, once regarded as one of the industry's loneliest artists, experienced a profoundly tragic life and death. Recent reports suggest that his wife has now disclosed shocking information about the events that contributed to his tragic journey. Let's delve into the details of the revelations she has made. Peter Sellers consistently asserted that beneath his vibrant roles and comedic personas, there was no real person, that he, in essence, did not exist. However, the reality was far darker. Behind the scenes, both on set and behind closed bedroom doors, Sellers engaged in some of the most intense and violent conflicts and romantic entanglements ever witnessed in Hollywood. There was indeed a man there, and his existence was a disturbing and tragic amalgamation of tumultuous relationships and personal struggles. I never thought I'd reach the day when somebody didn't know that's what you are. He said, well, if you sing it, I'll try. Born into the world of comedy in 1925, Peter Sellers' early life was deeply intertwined with the entertainment industry. His parents, Bill and Agnes Sellers, were performers in variety shows. Sellers had an unusual stage debut at a mere two weeks old when a family friend brought him on stage from backstage. However, despite the comedic surroundings, Sellers' childhood was far from lighthearted. A notable example is the naming of Sellers, Initially christened Richard Henry, his parents changed it to Peter in memory of his stillborn older brother. He said, aren't you going to play um, that, that's what you are? So Alan said, I'd love to play that's what you are. In his youth, Peter displayed early signs of the tumultuous relationships that would later consume his life. His connection with his mother Agnes was unusually tight but far from healthy. Agnes being assertive and Peter being reserved and timid shared a disturbing symbiotic dynamic. Despite this, Agnes had no qualms about leaving her only child for weeks on end while she and his father embarked on tours. It comes as no surprise that every romantic relationship Peter entered as an adult unfolded like a chilling horror story, leaving people to ponder the roots of his troubled connections. You know, I was very young when I married Peter Sellers and I was very naive and very unsophisticated. I'd just come out of Sweden. I could speak English because we were taught in school. In 1946, at the age of 21, Sellers, a W-2 survivor, set his sights on a career in the theater. After a period of scraping together review shows and securing minor television roles, he decided to make a bold move. Demonstrating his exceptional mimicry skills, Sellers called up BBC producer Roy Spear, assuming the identity of star radio host Kenneth Horne to capture the company's attention. <laughs> Hitler told funnier jokes than Churchill. <laughs> he had more hair than Churchill. <laughs> and he could dance the pants of old Churchill. Surprisingly, Seller's audacious ploy paid off. Spear, amused by the cheeky young sod, granted him an audition, a pivotal moment that would prove to be Seller's rendezvous with destiny. Through his involvement with the BBC, Sellers crossed paths with emerging comedians Harry Seckham and Spike Milligan. This fortuitous encounter led to the creation of the legendary radio comedy, The Goon Show, a production that one publication hailed as probably the most influential comedy show of all time. Beyond influencing future Monty Python performers, The Goon Show catapulted Sellers and his companions into the early stages of stardom. However, it was also at this juncture that the first signs of cracks in their collaboration began to appear. Peter Sellers was mad. Stanley was an awe of him. He could do things that Stanley couldn't do, which were like act. During this period, Sellers encountered the enchanting Australian actress Anne Howe, and their relationship progressed at a dizzying pace, some might argue too quickly. A mere year after their initial meeting, Sellers proposed, and by 1958, they were wedded with two children, Michael and Sarah, as part of their family. At this juncture, Sellers had the opportunity to embrace a tranquil life of fatherhood and sail into a content existence. However, spoiler alert, that wasn't the path he chose. Sellers, far from the conventional family man, exhibited a penchant for being downright cruel to his new wife. In a notable incident, the couple was at home one afternoon, with Peter engrossed in his work in the study while Anne attended to household chores. A sudden ring at the door prompted Anne to answer it, only to discover a telegram from Sellers in the adjacent room, instructing her to, bring me a cup of coffee, Peter. As we will soon discover, this disregard was merely the precursor to more troubling behavior. 
Peter Sellers gained a reputation as a womanizer, leading to the dissolution of his first marriage to Anne, with whom he had two children, in the early 1960s. His second marriage to Swedish actress Britt Eklund has been described as challenging, with Eklund highlighting Sellers' jealous, controlling, and abusive behavior, as reported by The Guardian. In recent years, Eklund has gone on record, suggesting that her former husband likely had bipolar disorder. She pointed to the intense bouts of depression and paranoia that marked his relationships with the women in his life as indicative of this condition. I was really his little toy, uh -huh. and he he had Norman Hartnell designed that gown without me even knowing it. See, wow. I, I, I See, they were all going, ah. Britt Eklund was just 21 when she encountered Sellers, who was 17 years her senior. Sellers, having seen her photograph in a newspaper, expressed his desire to meet her. The two swiftly married, with Sellers making his intentions public before formally proposing to Eklund. Sellers assumed control over nearly every aspect of their lives, dictating even the outfits his wife would wear. One impulsive decision, like a sudden holiday, resulted in Eklund losing her role in a Hollywood movie. Eklund has recounted instances of Sellers being both psychologically and physically abusive, resorting to throwing objects and damaging property when things didn't go his way. But, you see, he decided my life. If he didn't want to film, you know, I was offered lots of films, and if he didn't like it... As swiftly as Sellers and Eklund came together, their relationship took a sour turn. Ironically, the very trait that initially attracted Sellers to the actress, her undeniable beauty, also fueled his intense jealousy, leading him to believe that she would potentially cheat on him with any of her equally attractive co-stars. This paranoia triggered Sellers to adopt controlling behaviors, initially minor, but gradually escalating to intolerable levels. The first indication of Sellers' inclination to control his new bride emerged as he began dictating her wardrobe choices from head to toe. This began shortly after their honeymoon, with photographers capturing Eklund in a fur coat handpicked by Sellers. Eklund later revealed, he decided what I was going to wear. He just pre-decided everything without ever asking me. However, the worst was yet to come. Amid the fervor of their new relationship, Eklund secured a role in the 1964 film Guns at Batasi. However, Sellers, incapable of tolerating her absence on location, took control to an extreme. He called Eklund one day and insisted she take a day off from filming. When the production rejected this request, Sellers arranged for someone to drive her to the airport against her will and flew her to California where he was, ensuring she spent the weekend with him. I was sent to, to England. I was under contract 20th Century Fox and we did a photo shoot in the basement of the Dorchester. I'm laying on a piano with an Alice band. When Eklund landed in California, she only had the clothes on her back. But of course, Sellers had taken care of that too. He brought her back to a luxurious mansion where he'd kitted up an entire walk-in closet full of items for his bride. As Eklund remembered, he'd bought everything you could possibly need as a woman who didn't have any clothes, from evening gowns to bikinis. The bikini was actually of mink, I was floored. And this was just phase one. Upon Eklund's arrival, Sellers promptly had one of his personal doctors examine her. In a matter of seconds, the hired medic asserted that the seemingly healthy 21-year-old was too sick to resume filming Guns at Batazi and needed an indefinite period of recovery, conveniently alongside Sellers. Feeling compelled and having little say in the matter, Eklund acquiesced. The repercussions were harsh. Producers swiftly dismissed the starlet from the film, further deepening her dependence on Sellers. However, the comedian remained unsatisfied. After his divorce from Eklund, Sellers remarried twice more, to aristocrat Miranda McMillan and later to actress Lynn Frederick, to whom he was married at the time of his death. He sent his valet over and said, you know, Mr. Sellers would like to invite you for a drink. So I went over. I put a lot of clothes on because I didn't know who he was. Peter Sellers' erratic behavior towards those close to him was exacerbated by alcohol and the D he experimented with, as reported by the Daily Telegraph. While the 60s and 70s were marked by big drinking and fast-living Hollywood actors, Sellers' lifestyle had particularly disastrous effects on both his health and the people around him. Alcohol and D took a toll on his well-being, leading to Sellers experiencing his first heart attack before the age of 40, as noted by Roger Ebert. Unfortunately, adequate treatment was not promptly given for various reasons. Sellers' value to the production companies making his movies played a role in downplaying his heart issues, as highlighted by The Guardian. 
Additionally, Seller's own superstitions and pursuit of alternative methods further complicated his health situation. Despite the potential benefits of decisive medical intervention by pulmonary specialists, Sellers chose unconventional paths. Aside from that, being there was an ambition, you know, that I wanted to do all my life. Sellers' refusal to change his lifestyle, compounded by the similar habits of his fourth wife, Lynn Frederick, made it inevitable that his health would continue to deteriorate. His first marriage to Anne Howe ended due to his infatuation with Italian page and screen idol Sophia Loren. Sellers and Lauren collaborated on the 1960 movie The Millionaires and the novelty song Goodness Gracious Me, which Sellers performed in character, in an Indian accent, to promote the movie. Oh, doctor, I'm in trouble. Sellers didn't conceal his infatuation with Lauren. Colleagues on the set of The Millionaires noted that Sellers behaved childishly around Lauren, treating her like a pinup in his bedroom. Evenings at home with his family were often dominated by Sellers obsessively discussing Lauren's behavior and interactions with him each day. On one occasion, Sellers returned home and openly declared his love for Lauren to his wife. Sophia Loren was married to Italian movie producer Carlo Ponti, and their marriage endured until his death in 2007. Sellers asserted to friends that he and Loren were deeply involved in a passionate love affair, and he even claimed that she was going to leave her husband for him. However, there is no evidence to substantiate these assertions. Michael Sellers has suggested that it's conceivable Sellers' infatuation was merely a fantasy, fueled by the boost to his ego from being cast opposite such a glamorous S symbol. Being young, I was just, it was aware in my own sort of group and people, and, and, and when we went with him, wherever you went, you couldn't walk, you couldn't walk a street city block. It wasn't just his first wife, Anne, who had to deal with Sellers' ego-driven emotional problems. His declaration of love for Sophia Loren also occurred in front of his children, and his son, Michael, speaking to Sikov, described a moment when his father awoke him in the night to ask him the following question. Do you think I should divorce your mummy? The Sophia Loren episode is a striking example of Sellers' peculiar disregard for the feelings of his family, but in truth, they served as a consistent outlet for his insecurities. In an interview with The Scotsman, Michael Sellers recalled an incident when his father asked him, at the age of seven, which parent he liked best. Seller asked, who we love more, our mother or him? When Michael replied, mummy, it triggered a rage in Peter Sellers. Sellers' response was brutal. He kicked both children out of his presence and declared he never wanted to see them again. For a child, for me, not for him, for me. Having to wait every, wait every time that he had to stop and talk to someone. And then... Right, I'm sure that other people have had that experience mm. too. The following year, Michael stated that his father wrote him a letter claiming to disown him, advising the child to adopt his mother's maiden name, How. Michael, along with his sisters Sarah and Victoria, later penned a best-selling book about the treatment they received from their troubled father. Apart from the challenges of intermittent contact, distance, and mood swings, the most brutal treatment occurred at the time of Peter's death. Despite being firmly married to Anne Howe and having two young children at home, Sellers didn't hesitate to forge an exceptionally close relationship with Sophia Loren on the set. The exact nature of this closeness remains shrouded in mystery. While some of Sellers' closest associates insist it developed into a full-blown affair, others characterize it as a strong friendship. However, according to Sellers' own admissions, it was anything but innocent. Because I didn't know who he was. I just, I just read Swedish gossip papers that he had been a judge on a Miss Universe um, contest and he'd had a little bit of a... Whether or not Sellers consummated a romantic relationship with Sophia, he subjected his wife to an incredibly mortifying revelation. Following a day of working closely with Lauren on set, Sellers approached Anne and bluntly confessed that he was in love with Lauren, asserting that there was nothing she could do about it. Initially, the conversation lingered on this shocking admission. However, Sellers, true to form, elevated the stakes once again. Peter Sellers' unpredictable behavior towards those close to him was intensified by his indulgence in alcohol and experimentation with D, as reported by the Daily Telegraph. While big drinking and fast-living Hollywood actors were not uncommon in the 60s and 70s, the repercussions of such a lifestyle were particularly disastrous for Sellers and those in his inner circle. Notably, alcohol and D took a toll on his health, leading to Sellers experiencing his first heart attack before turning 40, according to Roger Ebert. Unfortunately, Sellers did not receive adequate treatment, partly because the production companies valued him so much that they downplayed his heart issues. Additionally, Sellers' own superstitions 
superstitions, as mentioned by the Scotsman, led him to pursue alternative methods rather than seeking decisive medical intervention from pulmonary specialists, which could have significantly impacted his health. That's what the fellow said after. He said I was dead for two minutes, clinically dead. And um, I, I guess I was, you know. I don't know, because it was just like going to sleep. Compounding these issues was Seller's refusal to change his lifestyle, a pattern exacerbated by the similar habits of his fourth wife, Lynn Frederick. This made it increasingly certain that Seller's health would continue to deteriorate over time. In the year his marriage crumbled, director Blake Edwards extended an offer that would become Seller's star-making role as the bumbling Inspector Clouseau in The Pink Panther. This opportunity, like much in Seller's life, was a peculiar stroke of luck. Edwards considered Sellers only after actor Peter Ustinov withdrew from the part. Moreover, Clouseau wasn't even the main character. The spotlight was on David Niven's lead role in the film. Nonetheless, Sellers was determined to upstage everyone and make his mark in the role. In the 1950s, Sellers, driven by an insatiable ambition, embarked on a dedicated pursuit of a film career, featuring in titles such as The Lady Killers alongside one of his idols, Alec Guinness. However, amid the glitz of radio fame and family life, a silent erosion was underway behind the scenes. Despite a consistent flow of work, Sellers had not quite achieved superstardom, and his innate shyness transformed into a debilitating insecurity that Hollywood success might forever elude him. Regrettably, this growing insecurity would soon metamorphose into something far more sinister. Good evening, Major Courtney. <laughs> Good evening, Professor. I hope I'm not too early. Not at all, not at all. Mrs. Wilberforce, may I? Faced with the looming specter of potential failure in his film career, Sellers sought solace in mysticism as a coping mechanism. While turning to spiritual guidance is not uncommon in Hollywood, Sellers' brand of mysticism had its unique quirks. He not only consulted with astrologer Maurice Woodruff, who would later exert considerable influence over his career decisions, but the comedian also developed a belief that the long-deceased obscure music performer Dan Leno was personally haunting him. Yes, something seemed awry, though the full extent of it remained hidden from everyone's awareness at that point. Around 1960, Sellers, through persistent effort, finally attracted attention, and director Anthony Asquith extended an offer for him to star as Indian Dr. Ahmed El Kabir in the romantic comedy The Millionaires. Initially hesitant, Sellers likely felt that the role didn't offer enough substance for his considerable talents, and not necessarily due to the problematic portrayal of the character. However, a discovery came to light that completely altered his perspective. Professor. Sellers finally agreed to play the good doctor for one reason, and one reason only, because he found out that his co-star would be none other than Italian bombshell Sophia Loren. He wasn't shy about his motives either. He excitedly told the press, I don't normally act with romantic, glamorous women. She's a lot different from Harry Seckham. Surprising almost no one, this was a recipe for utter disaster. In numerous ways, Sellers shaped Inspector Clouseau into the iconic character we recognize today. While the script provided the basic framework for the role, Sellers contributed everything else, from Clouseau's confidently foolish personality to his trademark costume of a trench coat, and even details like his accent, makeup, and thin mustache. All of these were the creative inventions of Sellers. His extensive involvement in crafting the character, especially after The Pink Panther became a smash hit, led to Sellers being likened to comedy legends such as Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. And it was uh, very interesting to see the reaction, you know, on various levels. Of course, uh, the, the audiences here are very sophisticated. They pick up very quickly, I noticed. In short, Sellers had successfully turned his life around and achieved a high note once again, only to, predictably, introduce complications and disrupt his newfound success. While Peter Sellers had the world laughing on screen, the real man proved to be an absolute nightmare on set. Even before The Pink Panther, rumors circulated about Sellers' challenging behavior during filming, ranging from tardiness to fumbling lines, particularly when he didn't have a fondness for the character he was portraying. During the filming of A Shot in the Dark, a reunion with Blake Edwards, the actor and director clashed to the point that they communicated solely through notes. We must find that woman. My Stradivarius. Yes, the uh, porter just brought it in. As time progressed, Sellers' diva-like temperament evolved into something downright alarming. 
At the zenith of his fame, it was widely known that Peter Sellers harbored a peculiar and vehement aversion to two seemingly innocuous colors, green and purple. He attributed his aversion to green to the belief that it gave him strange vibrations, leading him not only to refuse to wear the color, but also to decline acting opposite anyone dressed in green. As for purple, his reaction to that color was even more disturbing. Who are you? Our job is, sir. And what is it you do? I am the butler. I'm the butler, it's here, it's here. Reportedly, Sellers adopted his distaste for purple from his former director, Vittorio De Sica, who had once referred to it as the color of death. This singular comment was enough for Sellers, and his fear of the color became so intense that his publicist had to meticulously check his hotel rooms for any trace of purple to prevent violent outbursts. In 1964, Sellers experienced another fortuitous turn. He played a significant role in the instant classic Dr. Strangelove, directed by the renowned auteur Stanley Kubrick, one of the few directors with whom Sellers never clashed. The film not only provided Sellers with a harmonious working relationship, but also showcased his versatility by featuring him in three distinct roles, President Merkin Muffley, Dr. Strangelove himself, and group captain Lionel Mandrake. Each character was a source of comedic gold. Single favorite role? Uh, well, uh, aside from being there, I think the thing, the film I most enjoyed being in was Dr. Strangelove. For someone like Sellers, who lived for his characters, this was a dream come true. However, just as things were looking up, an unforeseen complication entered the scene. Indeed, Sellers' anxieties regarding Eklund's youth and beauty intensified over the weeks, causing a significant distraction in his own professional life. Concurrent with the tumultuous firing incident involving Eklund, Sellers was engaged in filming Kiss Me Stupid alongside director Billy Wilder and co-stars Dean Martin and Kim Novak. Describing his onset experience as taking a nosedive would be a considerable understatement. I think for, uh, in certain instances, very well, yeah. But what did those magic. films have? It was oh, so they had a magic, you see, they had a magic. They had the magic of, of that wonderful... While Sellers had a pre-existing reputation for being challenging to work with, his clashes with Wilder reached a new low. Clearly affected by his issues with Eklund, Sellers began instigating conflicts with Wilder on the set, primarily revolving around their divergent artistic visions for the film. Since marrying his young and attractive bride, Sellers had become fixated on achieving what he referred to as the ultimate climax in the bedroom. One fateful night, he went to extreme measures to fulfill his desires. In April 1965, just before engaging in intimate activities with Eklund, Sellers inhaled amyl nitrite, commonly known as pop to enhance his performance. However, instead of achieving the desired effect, it led to a terrifying incident. The potent stimulants pushed Sellers' body to the brink, resulting in him experiencing cardiac arrest right in front of Eckland and in the midst of their intimate encounter. In a harrowing three-hour span, Sellers endured a staggering eight heart attacks. Although he somehow survived the ordeal, he did not emerge from it unscathed. As it happens, having eight heart attacks in three hours is extremely bad for your health, and Sellers was forced to drop out of Billy Wilder's Kiss Me, stupid to focus on his recovery. In response, Wilder had zero sympathy for his difficult former lead. When the auteur heard the reason why Sellers called it quits, he sniped, you have to have a heart before you can have an attack. Sellers eventually returned to work, and in 1967, he took on a role in Casino Royale, a James Bond parody featuring a star-studded cast including Orson Welles and Ursula Andress. In the film, Sellers portrayed the character Evelyn Tremble, a Baccarat master set to confront Welles' villain, Le Chiffre. However, with Sellers involved, the comedian introduced some unforgettable drama. Given the multiple writers and an ensemble cast, the set of Casino Royale was notorious for its chaotic atmosphere, and Sellers did little to improve the situation. It's reported that he was displeased with the film's comedic direction and aspired to be part of a more serious Bond film. According to biographer Roger Lewis, Sellers continuously rewrote the script in an attempt to make his character more heroic and less parodic. However, a more significant threat loomed on the set. And uh, this guy sat down and he said, uh, Oi, Franco, Benny Qui. Sellers obviously suffered from mental health issues throughout his life, but as his demons got worse, 
he remained staunchly opposed to seeking any professional help. Besides causing him a world of trouble, it also makes his ailments difficult to diagnose. But his ex-wife, Britt Eklund, had one idea. Eklund believed that Sellers suffered from bipolar personality disorder. However, his fans never stopped supporting him. One of them wrote, Yes, his life was a mess, and his marriages were disastrous, but there's no denying Peter Sellers was a brilliant actor. His Dr. Strangelove performance is immortal. Another one added, Peter Sellers in his Pink Panther movies always made me laugh till I cried and my stomach hurt laughing. No one has ever done this to me in a movie. How sad his life was, but it seems tortured souls seem to make the best comedians. Ripe my favorite. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.